Okay, welcome back. So this is session number two of Mass and Storytelling in Spark AR for Culture Hub's CoLab. I'm Ashley Jane Lewis, and today we're going to be talking about mass as protection. So I would say that this is probably the most commonly known utilization of mass. And uh, if you think back to television shows or movies that you've watched, and certainly I'm sure in your school textbooks, you'll see that masks have shown up across the entirety of the human race as a means of physical protection from battle or physical harm. Um, perhaps the lesser known utilization for masks uh, is a spiritual one or a more abstract one. So across um, the globe, ancestors of many cultures have used mass to ward off of things like, you know, bad energy or um, bad luck, sadness, heartbreak, and these kinds of uh, intangible things we're trying to avoid are really, I, I think, really, really beautifully articulated in these masks, first of all. But second of all, I think a really um, interesting way that we can think about how AR filters are expressing those kinds of desires as well. So yeah, we're going to think about masks in a really broad context today. And as we did last time, we're going to look at some examples online of people who are creating masks um, and utilizing masks of this theme. So just like last time, you don't need much. You need Spark AR. Last time we also looked at Pixlr. That would be helpful for you to grab as well. Um, you'll want a notebook and a pen or a pencil. And uh, of course, we'll be applying these um, sessions with the three C's, criticality, creativity, curiosity, in order to build like a nice, well-rounded practice as we go through these modules. So uh, let's dive into the examples and then we'll do a little writing exercise, move to Spark AR, and then conclude with one more writing prompt. So let's look at what we've got. Okay, so... If you're watching this in real time, as in the season that it was posted in, you, like me, are probably very accustomed to seeing this kind of mask. So this obviously is a COVID mask. Uh, we're in quarantine right now. Hopefully, I mean, with any luck, you'll be watching this and thinking back on quarantine. But in the moment right now, we're in quarantine, which makes us uh, you know, closer to uh, an interesting perspective for this mass making session because all of a sudden in the last five months we've gained a lot more expertise on what it means to wear a mask every day and and by that i mean i think that as we as we think about creatively using mass we have some lived experience that would help us understand what the boundaries that could be pushed are like for masks. So now that you wear one every day, what could a creative mask look like? What could a mask of different kinds of protection look like? We, we have this like experiential knowledge because we've been protecting ourselves from COVID-19 with this mask. Um, so on the topic of masks now, we've got uh, a lot of interesting things happening in the world of technology and masks, um, specifically as it revolves around facial recognition, which is Essentially, you know, AR filters are built on top of, in part, facial recognition. So uh, I want to show you this example of um, something that becomes very has become very trendy over time. These these masks that have these faces printed on them. So this is in theory supposed to be a print of your own face on this mask, uh, and the reason behind that is um, to try and create more fluidity for unlocking your phone, if you can believe it. So uh, <laughs> I think that this is kind of wild uh, and interesting as like a, a case study in how we work around or innovate around our, our constraints. So yes, this mask will help unlock our phone, which I think is really interesting because I it starts to make us question how realistic our facial features have to be or how close to true they have to be in order to be able to um, engage with our with our phone like it really makes you think about like how much information how much detail can the phone retain to understand that this uh, is a, a way to unlock it that this face is 
a version or a depiction of our face. Um, it's just like something to think about in terms of like the data that our phone is collecting. And um, I think it's also interesting to think about this socially. So <laughs> what changes about society when we're walking around with frozen expressions on our faces? What changes about society when we have to think about other ways, maybe with our hands or maybe with our eyes or bodily expression to convey emotion when there's a static emotion painted on our face. Um, so what changes about our relationship to communication in this way? Um, in the less realistic examples category. Um, you know, uh, as I'm sure you've probably seen, at least in movies, historically, we've got lots of examples of masks. Um, maybe most known are the like Roman gladiator masks, and here are some examples of that. Um, and what I was, why I bring the Romans up specifically is because I think we always have like a, it might be the thing that we can conjure up in our, in our imagination the fastest when we think about mass for battle. I came across this really incredible Roman mask here that actually is supposed to like pre protect your face, but seems to also be conveying a particular emotion as well. Um, so this is made of metal, another kind of uh, Roman mask. And I guess I just want to prompt you to think about in the same way that like this plasters a particular kind of facial expression on our faces, what the implications are like, what does it mean to have this facial expression in battle? What does it mean to be expressing a particular kind of emotion? Um, and, and I think that if I was to guess an emotion that would be frozen on a mask for Roman battle, I don't think that I would have pictured this. Um, this is quite emotionally evocative. And I wonder uh, if you could take a second to just think like, what kind of emotion is this mask trying to convey? And why would a person want to convey that in a battlefield or in battle related environments? I wouldn't want to end our examples without looking at something a little more science fiction or speculative. Of course, like, as you could probably imagine, I enjoyed the Black Panther move, uh, movie and all of the affiliated drawings and fan art. And I think that the mask in Black Panther is a really interesting version of protection because it is technologically advanced, meaning that the wearer doesn't always have to put it on, it can generate over the wearer's face if there's a detection of danger or um, trouble. And so I would love for us to think about this kind of mask as well when we consider um, what changes about our relationship to protection when protection is um, it is also generated by a kind of AI and artificial intelligence that tells us when we need protection. So these are the kinds of masks I wanted to show you just to inspire a little bit of a range of thought as it pertains to your masks. So hopefully that gives you some insight into what's possible or what you could be thinking about. Now grab your notebook and we're gonna take some time to outline what we want our mask to look like. So what, first of all, do you, in your envisioning for this mask, like, what do you want protection from? Is this physical protection as in some kind of like story or narrative aid to like the world you're depicting in your head? Is this emotional protection like, or you know, abstract protection? Maybe you want protection from bad luck or maybe you want protection from something as concrete as like the sun or the rain when it storms, like thinking about mass in all these different ways. Um, you could reinvent your quarantine masks if you wanted to. So write down uh, the story behind this mask, why it exists, who you are in this world where this mask exists. Um, I'm gonna keep leaning into some of the space exploration that I talked about in the first video. And so my mask is going to, um, protect me from different elements like out in the galaxy. And I'll show you a little more about that when we get into Spark AR. But 
yeah, in your head, think about what it is that this mask is protecting you from, who you are in this world. Maybe you are who you are right now, and this mask is like a very tangible mask to the current world we're sitting in, or maybe it's something more inventive than that. Um, but write a story about the usage of this mask, draw a picture of what this mask looks like, and then um, we're going to take just a small slice of that mask and try to recreate something in Spark AR um, that looks a little bit like it. Uh, so take a second now, pause the video, and try to draw your mask and write down your story. All right, so we're back in Spark AR for our filter component of today's module. Um, you'll remember this guy from the last video here in the display. Um, we have our viewport, our scene, our assets area, our inspector. Okay. So now um, we're going to be making a couple of cool filters. We're going to be creating another mask, which will be interesting, and um, a particle system, and even some interactivity today, which is really exciting. So um, I'm going to change the camera from this, this gentleman to my face. So I'll go here to the camera icon on the leftmost toolbar, and I'll hit my, my webcam. And just as a reminder, Spark AR takes a little while to, uh, you know, catch up to the video. So it's going to look out of sync, but your video is working fine. So my, my depiction and my sound is probably not going to line up, but uh, don't panic about that. Okay, so first we're going to start with our particle system. And uh, what we need to do, we've made a new project, obviously. And now looking inside of our scene area, we're going to click on the focal distance and we're going to add a new object. So inside of the objects area, we're gonna scroll all the way to the bottom to see particle system. Okay, so this looks kind of familiar, right? We've got uh, axes uh, on this object so we can tell that like this particle system just like our face mesh in the last video has the potential to be um, operated in three-dimensional space so we know where these particles are located in 3d space um, the other thing that we recognize is this sort of checkerboard um, pattern on the particles which means if you remember to the last video that of course we haven't added a material to any of this um, so Let's uh, start by looking at the inspector for this particle emitter and uh, let's add our material down here. So remember it generates a new material here and it connects it to the material over here in the assets area. So in the assets area we can go over, click that material and then do some of the same things we did yesterday. So because this is not going to contour to the face positions or like, you know, the depth of my face, I'm going to change this from standard to flat, which helps its render time. And um, now uh, let's change it to a particular kind of look. So this is like, you know, particles that are in our environment, eventually these particles will be interactive and react to our face. So for now, just as you're like learning this tutorial, um, you can add whatever image you'd like. You can grab whatever, whatever image you think is exciting to try this with um, from like Google Images or wherever. I'm going to choose an image that I made for this activity. So um, I'm going to start with these little stars. It looks kind of like my stars are coming from my nose right now. Um, so I, I don't think I'll end up with stars necessarily, but they're kind of like a fun thing for us to test um, as we work through this filter. So a couple of things you will recognize from before. Of course, we've got the opacity that allows us to change how dark or translucent and opaque our stars are. So I'm going to leave them around here. 
and um, there are some other assets like remember yesterday we looked at like the offset to change the position hold off on doing the position changing we actually have some other areas where we're going to be making those adjustments so for now we're just going to leave it at this um, at these settings so we want to look at the scene area and we can see that the um, the emitter, these particle emitters, so maybe I'll, this is a good time for me to rename them. Rename to star emitter. Um, and while I'm here, I may as well change this to star material. And let me rename this to star texture. Okay, so the star emitter over here is a child of the camera. Remember, um, when we create items that are nested inside of these folders, we also call them children of or the childs of the category they're under. So we, we having this emitter inside of the camera are forcing the particles to be tied to our camera movement. Um, and so I can show you an example of that, like what I just did. If you click on your face in the display port and you drag it left and right, you'll see that in the middle of our viewport, we're getting an example of what it might look like for um, the screen to be like moved around to, to see uh, a variety of different areas in our world. So you can imagine me moving my phone in like the left and right direction right now. And you'll see that as I'm doing that, the stars are still appearing right in the middle of the screen. What would be more exciting is if the stars were kind of spread out in this 3D world so that depending on where I look, we'll see different sizes of stars to represent stars that are closer to us and further away in our perspective view. So, in order to make that happen, remove our emitter from being a child of the camera. We have to detach it from being associated to the camera. So I'm gonna grab the star emitter and I'm just gonna drag it below the microphone. And you can see now if I close the camera, um, the camera folder, the star emitter is no longer folded inside of that grouping. So it's no longer a child of the camera. This is a stars living on their own. So now that you can see um, that it's below it, we have like new visuals down here. So our stars are now being generated out here in the middle of 3D space. So not attached to the screen or the camera, but out in the middle of 3D space. So if I move my, my phone around, you'll see that I am not seeing the stars, but that the stars are also not following my face. So so far, so good. Not quite what we want to end up with, but that's a really good starting place for us to be able to like sprinkle these stars out inside of our three-dimensional space. So um, when we click on the stars and when we click on the stars and we go over to the inspector, we can see that now instead of attached to the camera, um, our Stars are in the space of world view, which means that they can be placed anywhere in this environment, in this big gray world that we have here. Um, and so uh, we can take a look at some of the different ways in which we can view that. Right now in the emitter type, we're witnessing our stars all generating from the same point in the world. So that is tied to our setting of point in the emitter type. So there's a whole bunch of different kinds. So let's just try line for a second. And you might not have seen anything change yet, but we have to change the length of the line. So right now our stars are being shown, uh, populated from this one tiny pixel, this one tiny area, 0.1 on our canvas. But if we make this line a little longer, like let's say we make it like 10 pixels long, if we zoom out, we can see that 
our emitter, our pixels, our little stars are all being generated along the line on this X axis. Pretty cool, right? And if we make this a little shorter, like let's say we make it five, then we'll see like a closer concentration of those stars. So now they're like getting a little bit closer to one another. And if I made this, I don't know, like 100, they would be really, really, really spread apart, so much so that we can barely see all of them at once. I'm going to keep them kind of close, like maybe six. Um, so we can see them, but there's still quite a lot of them. There are so many exciting settings here in the um, space of, uh, in the spaces and the options for this inspector. So uh, what do you think birth rate does? Let's try changing this number to something super high. Like let's say, let's make this 100. So when I change it to 100, you can see that all of a sudden we've generated a whole bunch of new stars, like way more stars than we had before. Birth rate is however, how many stars are generated every second. And so at every second in like random form, our stars are being generated across this line. And so we can even add a little bit more variant here with the percentage. So this gets us um, out of like the absolute number of like 100 stars generated every second and gives us a little bit more variety and like adds a couple milliseconds to every star's birth so that it kind of looks a little more organic. So maybe I'll put this at like 10% and we get a tiny little variation to the way that our stars are um, generated, are, are birthed. Another fun one to play with is the speed. So um, here we can change this number to be a little higher. We'll get a faster generation of um, stars. And if we make it a little lower, we'll get a slower generation of stars. You can see they're kind of trickling through. And you can keep playing with some of these settings. There's all kinds of really cool things. There's the angle. So like if they all kind of like flow to the right <laughs> or if you change, so you can see there's a little gray X there. So they, they would flow in the direction of the X location. So 12, 12 in that box is going to make them all flow like a little bit, like 12 pixels as they rise to the left. If I made this negative 12, then they would all flow just like 12 pixels to the right as they generated. I'm just gonna bring this down back to zero so that they all just flow upwards. If you open up the particle section, it's a little bit lower. You can also see that you can change the scale. Um, I like the size that these stars are, but I feel like they don't live very long. Like, let me scroll in. They don't really reach the camera, um, the top of the camera. If I'm like dragging this here, you can see that they don't really live very long. They kind of like pop right away. So I can actually change the lifespan of my stars so that they float a lot higher. I think that that's probably too high because like I'm not gonna be able to see any of this up here. So maybe I'll just change it to something a lot lower so that at the very least they live for the amount of seconds that it takes to reach the top of my camera screen. Maybe just like one second it looks like. Yeah, cool. Okay, so um, it doesn't really help. Um, the way that we're looking at this is really cool and it helps us visualize all the changes in the setting. But as you can see in my phone here, I actually can't see these stars on my filter. These are just stars that are being generated out in the world of our three dimensional space. So I'm gonna change the emitter from the line type to the ring type. And all of a sudden, look, you can sort of see a couple of those stars. And uh, the ring is really interesting. Right now we have a very tight ring where all of these stars are being generated. Let's just widen the ring, uh, the radius of that ring a little bit. And all of a sudden we have a lot more stars available. Even if I pan my camera around, I can really see quite a few of these stars. And I want you to think about like, so if I pause here for a second, 
look at our stars and tell me in this camera if you're seeing a, a variety of different sizes. Why do you think we're seeing so many different sizes? We haven't actually changed the scale of our star. We still are getting different size stars. So why might that be? Our scale is determined by, the scale of the star is determined by how far away the star is from our, from our phone. So in this three-dimensional space, the camera starts here and our phones are here and stars are being generated between the camera and the phone. So what happens if you, for instance, let me take this a marker and put it really close to the camera, it looks a lot bigger, right? You can see um, it's a little delayed, but you can see the video in this display. The pen looks really, really big because the pen is close to the camera. If I move the pen away from the camera, it looks a lot smaller. And that's what's happening with our stars too. So all the stars that are being generated really close to the camera, so imagine this little yellow box as a camera that's pointed towards the screen of our phone. All the stars that are generated really close to the camera are gonna look really big. And all the stars that are generated really close to the phone are gonna look a lot smaller. So that's why we're getting this variety in sizes. I feel like I'm getting distracted by how fast these stars are moving. So I think I might slow them down a little bit. That's a little calmer. Maybe even just a little more, a little slower. Okay, cool. So now we've got this like very tranquil, upward facing cascade of stars. Um, we can even change the way that they're flowing. So all of these stars, for instance, are like flowing upwards. How would we get the stars to flow downwards? You can imagine them maybe not as stars, but as like raindrops or other kinds of like falling matter. And we want to try and find the right setting that would reverse the orientation. Um, what do you think the setting is? Give you a second to guess or maybe try a couple things. The setting is actually the speed. So the speed is propelling our particles upward. So every time the, every time the computer refreshes its screen, which is like many, many, many times a second, um, close to like 30 times a second, <laughs> um, uh, our particles are being raised by 0 0.1 pixel. So if we wanted to rain it down, we would put a negative number here and all of a sudden our stars would start to fall below like they're raining. And if that's the case, you might want to like raise your position of your stars up a little bit in the Y axis, like make them start a little higher. So if we can make them, oops, that's a bit too high. We can make them start a little bit higher so that it does look like it's raining. So we've raised the camera up by a few pixels so that it looks like it's raining stars. We can put it up a little more to look like it's coming from above the frame of the camera, of the phone. Okay, so I really liked it coming from below. So, I mean, you can make it come from the left, you know, whatever you want. So I am gonna make it, come from below. So I'm gonna change that back to flowing upwards. So it makes me feel like we're like traveling through space. So now if I were to spin the camera, you know, every time my phone intersects with some stars, I'm gonna see that in my environment, which also means that when we export this filter to our phones, if you choose to do that, you'll see stars when you have your phone facing you. And in reverse camera mode, when you're looking out into the world on your phone with this filter, you'll also see stars, which will be really cool. And every time you move your phone around, you'll see those stars. Now, I'll add a screen recording of that for you to see. 
Okay, um, great. So now that we have that sorted, um, we can have a couple different kinds of emitters, but we'll get to that in a second. Um, let's go and add our face mask. We're gonna add a new face mask, a new um, mask that depicts the kind of things that would help protect you from whatever you're trying to avoid in this, in this storytelling setting. So remember how we created some of these things before. We're gonna go to the camera option, so I'll uncurl, open up that folder. And with the camera selected, we're gonna add a new object, the face tracker. And inside of the face tracker, we're going to right click and we're going to add a face mesh. And here comes our face mesh again, right? We have this pattern just like yesterday where we uh, have this pattern as a placeholder for our material. I'm gonna go ahead and in the inspector add a material, create a new one. Okay, and that's generated a new material over here. And I'm just gonna call this material um, protection mask material. Okay, so yesterday we played with um, the face paint version of these masks. So this looks familiar to you, I'm sure, um, but or not yesterday, but in the previous video. And so this is kind of like your choice this time around. You can choose to continue to play with the face paint filter so that your mask looks like it's like painted on skin. So if that's the kind of look you're going for, you can choose the face paint option for the shader type. Or um, you can choose the standard mask, which looks a lot more like this, kind of like a cartoon. It doesn't like quite resemble my facial features accurately, um, but it looks like a mask that my actual body is wearing, something that's like been placed on top of my face. There's also the physically based mask. So you've got this kind of like shiny mask that might be interesting to you too. So whatever you want to do, um, you can choose the mask that works for you. So I think I'm going to stick with the face paint version because I like the texture of it. And I think it fits the overall kind of mask I'm thinking about for protection. Um, and you can choose what you'd like. And this is maybe a good time to encourage you to pause, go over to Pixlr. So remember we looked at Pixlr in the last video. It's a free version of um, a photo editing software, or a graphics editing software. And um, it's a lot like Photoshop or Illustrator. And here in this like 14 by 14 inch square, 1000 by 1000, you can go to the last video to get a little more detail. You can design what you want your protective mask to be. So this time, instead of designing pieces that are collaged together, you can choose to create one full sheet and apply that whole sheet to this mask. So you're gonna fill your design from edge to edge, uh, remembering that what we talked about yesterday, which is that if you think about where the position of the eyes and the mouth would be, those are things you can test and adjust until you export a version that fits your particular face. So you can add some circles or some um, designs, hoping to uh, situate them on the eyes. I'll show you a um, example. If I wanted something circular along my eyes, I could create this circle. And here is the center of the image. And this is gonna be likely around the area where your nose is. But if you go into the top left side of this quadrant, you're probably gonna hit your eyes. There's another eye. If you go just lower, just below the center, this will be close to your mouth. So you can, you know, everybody's face is different obviously. So you can add your elements into this design save it and download it, try it on your face, 
make some notes about the adjustments and then um, try again. So once you've designed your mask for your protection narrative, you can come back to Spark AR and add that texture to your, um, to your file. So we'll do that here in the texture section. You can go to new texture. And I made one that I really like. Um, I was really interested in thinking about a mass that's like a black hole, like something that might like absorb energy or um, remove um, remove like radicals from the space environment. So I have a couple that I wanted to look at. I have this one that's just loading, which I think is pretty cool. I also have this one. which is also really interesting, I think. Um, so this is the protective mask I'm going to use, thinking about the, re the responsibility that black holes have in space and the kinds of things that they do for that ecosystem. Um, if you can call, I guess you could call the space environment an ecosystem. So uh, again, changing the, you can change the opacity, the brightness, some of those elements here. Okay, so now that we have our mask and we have our particles, um, I think it would be really interesting to think about adding some interaction. And so this is where we get to our first step towards coding. Now, there's lots of different ways in which people enter into the world of coding. And one of my favorite ways is through um, block scripting. Uh, and so this is the idea of connecting blocks together to form a set of instructions for our code. I'm going to show you what I'm talking about. So if you've ever worked with, um, if you've ever worked with Scratch, if you remember that software that came out of MIT where you drag and connect blocks, it's really similar to that. So first let's go to the view um, and we want to add our patch editor. So we want to hit show patch editor. And that brings up this area right here at the bottom. And so this added, this area is going to be where we can like make some interactivity, some drag and drop interactivity by connecting blocks. And over time, as we become better and better at connecting these blocks, we can transition into scripting from scratch or scripting from some pre-existing code. So um, let me gr grab a block and tell you what we're going to do. The purpose of this exercise is to add a touch interaction to our Spark AR. So here in the, in the like uh, display and the viewport, we have this little like triple line in the top corner. And if you click that, it actually allows for you to simulate some elements of what you might do on an actual device. So um, when I was dragging my screen around like I am now, you can see the stars, I'm like intersecting with some of these stars on this beautiful environment we've created. I'm doing that because this capability is checkmarked, the simulate orbit capability. Now, I want us to try and simulate touch, like if you were to tap the screen, something was, uh, was to take place. So let's hit simulate touch. And we end up with this circle where our cursor should be, our mouse should be. And right now, if I touch the screen, nothing happens. And so thinking about um, what we might do with touch in relation to mass as protection, I think is really exciting because um, in this next few minutes, we're going to uh, create a touch interactive filter where we'll have these particles that are harmful floating by us. We can tap the screen to apply our mask and then the particles will change into something more positive. So it kind of represents the things we're trying to avoid, putting on our mask and representing the things that we're, that we're uh, trying to acquire or attain like the positive end of that protection. Okay, so down here in the, the patch editor, 
we're going to double click on this area and it brings up all of these features. These are all categories of patches. So there are patches to help you work with audio. You can scroll through them and see there's lots of really exciting ones here. There are patches to help you work with de your device, patches for logic and math and shaders and time. Right now we're going to look in the interaction category. So scroll down into interaction and hit the screen tap option. And it shows some features here, some um, details. So the screen tap block helps capture a tap anywhere on the screen. So uh, let's add that patch. It shows up as a little block here. You can drag it around the screen if you want to. And so if you want to ever see those details again, um, you can hit this gear and hit patch info and it will show up here again. Now there are two outputs and there's one uh, input. This is a kind of patch um, that has specific functionality. So this is for screen tap, as we said, and the output that we're looking for is this little one marked um, in gray that says tap, Let me zoom in here. This is gonna be our starting place for our interaction. So just to make everything a little more streamlined, let's go to our star emitter and let's just turn it off by hitting visible for a second. We're going to focus on the mass for now. So the goal is bad particles, mass protection gets applied by tapping the screen, good particles arrive. So um, we're going to just turn off the particles for a second so we can really concentrate on a tap that turns the mask on and off. So first we've got our screen tap block. Now, uh, we want another block for our face mask, which is really exciting. I, we haven't seen this feature yet. So if you go to the face mesh, you'll notice that beside um, some of these features, there's a little arrow that highlights yellow when you scroll over it. Everything with that little yellow arrow can be converted into a block for the patch editor. So we want the mask to appear and disappear as we continue to tap the screen. So because we want it to do that, there's like only so many options. We've got like position, scale, rotation, but we also have this one called visible. So let's tap the arrow next to visible. And inside of our patch editor, we get this, this block, this patch called the face mesh. So inside of this patch is a lot of code all connecting whatever threads we create to this face mask on our face. Everything inside of this block, this patch, is lines of code or lines of code that are attached to whether or not we have tapped the screen. So inside of each of these patches, inside of these blocks are lines of code that are running all the time to determine what kind of, you know, action that patch is associated to. Um, so we're like this much closer to coding um, and inside runs code, like you can imagine little, I don't know, a little bit like what you might see in like the matrix or something like that, like a couple lines of code running at all times inside of these patches. Um, so now we need to think about like between the, the screen tab and the face mesh turning off and on, what needs to happen? So we want the face mesh to appear and disappear when we tap the screen. And because there are only two options, appearing or disappearing, in the world of coding and algorithms, we like to think about this as a switch. So something that can be turned on or turned off. So um, if there are only two options, we usually think about those as a switch. You might also think about it in other situations as a Boolean, but in this context, you can think about it as a light switch going off and on, right? The face mask going off and on. So that might help you think about this action as a switch. So let's double tap on the screen again. And the switch is in utilities down here. Um, toggles between a Boolean output for every input event. So we've got turn on, turn off. These are features of our patch. So let's add that here. 
Now, if we, uh, the cool thing about the patch editor is that all we do now to create our effect, our interaction, is we connect these blocks with threads. So each one of these can be attached to the patch beside it. And the cool thing about this is that, you know, it helps us create interactions without being worried too much about glitches because if the code would never work for what you're for the you know collection of patches that you're creating those patches will not be able to connect to each other so this really helps us avoid having to you know debug and look through glitches and error messages it's a really great way to understand logic in coding so here we are back at the tap. We know that what we want to do is like center our attention on the tap. So we can grab this tap. We can pull, uh, like click and hold and drag to pull it out to this thread. We're like connecting a thread. And now we have to decide like which one of these three do we want to attach it to? What do you think? Do we want to attach our screen tap to a flip? Think about what that might mean. Do we want to attach it to something that's going to continue to turn elements on? Or do we want to attach it to something that's going to turn elements off? So when we create this interaction, we're going to be able to turn the mask off and on with our finger tap on the screen, which means we can't just have it turn on. We can't just have the tap turn it off. We actually need something that's going to flip back and forth between turning things on and turning things off. So we're gonna attach this thread to the flip. So now our screen tap is connected to that flip. So this flip is going to flip that switch. If it's off, it will turn it on. If it's on, it will turn it off. And we can test this right now with our finger um, if again, making sure that we've got the simulate touch option on, we can hit the screen. Our mask isn't going to change because we haven't connected that thread yet. But what you, what you will see here is like a little pulsing of light to give us the indication that in fact, our screen tap has flipped our switch from on to off or off to on. Okay, so now we wanna connect this to our face mesh. There. I want to connect this to our face mesh. And uh, now we can see that if we tap our screen, our face mesh does in fact disappear and reappear. So this is the act of us putting on our protective mask. So it's off, now it's on, it's off, now it's on. It's pretty cool. Okay, so now we need to think about what kind of uh, particles are going to be the things we're trying to avoid and what kind of part particles are going to be the, the thing we're trying to, the thing that celebrates having put on this mask to avoid those negative particles. You don't have to have positive particles if you don't want to. If you just want to have negative particles that disappear when you put the mask on, that's totally fine. Um, I'm going to do both so that you can see what that looks like in your patch editor. Um, so I am going to take my stars and I'm going to change them to some you know, thematic space, uh, more thematic space related things. So I'm gonna go to my star emitter. Now we want two kinds of particles. So um, I'm just gonna turn this on so we can see these are stars. I'm gonna duplicate this, duplicate. So now I have two sets and um, I'm going to rename this particles um, to avoid emitter. And let's rename the second one to positive particles emitter. Okay, so I've made two 
graphics that I'm going to use inside of these. So let's do this one first. This is the particles to avoid. Um, it's connected, as we know, to uh, what's called the star material right now. I actually don't want stars anymore, so I'm going to click this arrow and I'm going to add a new particle. I can't really see, it's too far down the screen. There we go. Oops. Let's minimize some of those so I can get to it. Okay, new particle, so I'm, or a new material here. And I'm going to rename this. Um, let's make this one particles to avoid. And now by clicking on that, I'm going to turn them into flat objects. And I'm going to choose my texture. I made these like cute little red, almost like fiery space radicals that I would like to avoid by wearing my mask. And now uh, let's go over to the positive particles. We're going to go down to Close some of that down to the materials. We're going to add a new material. Over here, we'll rename it positive particles. And now in the inspector, we'll change it to flat and we'll choose the new texture. And I have these gray versions that look like the fire has been extinguished from my dangerous particles. So you can make anything you want. So your positives could be reflective of um, positive energy and the negatives could be reflective of negative energy. You can have like, if you're being really practical, you can have rain and then um, as your negative particles that you're trying to avoid with your mask and then like something that represents sunshine for your positive particles. Or maybe if you're like trying to avoid heartbreak, then you can think about symbols that resemble that. Um, or you can be completely abstract and just determine kind of like this in this fantasy world that you're that you're creating this is the symbol for positive and these are the symbols for negative like whatever whatever makes you happy so and and whatever is associated to your story so um now that i have these particles and they're all moving I want to attach them to the touch interface so that they turn off and on with the right uh, in the right context. So one of the particles kind of follows the same pattern as the mask. Our positive particles turn on when the mask is on to represent like a celebration or that like we've neutralized the danger. And so it will also, those positive particles will also turn off when the mask is off. So we can set up our positive particles to really match the touch interaction of our face mesh. So um, the, for me, the positive ones are the gray ones because it looks like, you know, the flame is out. So I'm going to go over to the positive particles and I'm going to click that little yellow arrow in the inspector beside visible to get a block or to get a patch inside of the patch editor. And I'm going to just, you know, take another thread from the switch and attach it to the positive particles. And now when I touch the screen, the gray particles should be gone and you can see that they are. And when I touch the screen again, the gray particles come back. Now the other thing that we're of course missing is the opposite interaction for our dangerous radicals, our dangerous particles. So um, let's add a extra feature for that. 
So we're going to go to the particles to avoid and let's turn in, them off for this interaction. So they're going to be off either way, right? Because we turned them off. But let's put our mask on and our particle, our positive particles on and keep our negative uh, particles off for a second. Click that arrow to get the block. Okay, just trying to make sure you can see everything at once. Let's put this a little closer so that you know it's negative. Okay, and so now we want to connect it to our switch. The trouble is, what do you think is going to happen when I connect it right now? I guess I kind of spoiled it, but let's see. If I took the thread and I connected it right now, everything is on. And when I click the button, everything is off. And it doesn't matter if I change the setting here because it says that the setting is being um, set in the patch editor, which means that we can no longer use this feature to control how the particles behave. So what do we do? Let's delete this line. So to delete a connection, you click that connection until it glows blue, and then you just hit delete on your keyboard. How do we turn this off while these are on? There's actually this really handy patch inside of logic. So usually when you have to like puzzle your way through the functions of something um, and, and the way that it, it, you know, reads information, usually that patch is inside of logic. So inside of logic, we've got like all of these great patches to choose from. What do you think we should choose? Which one? We have this patch called not, and if we click on it, we get some information that says that it flips a Boolean from true to false or from false to true. Now, as I mentioned, Boolean is another word for a switch. A Boolean is a decision that only has two outcomes, a true or a false. And in this case, our switches, you know, are also Booleans because either our tap will happen once or will happen, <laughs> either our mass will be on or it will be off. So I feel like this patch is going to help us a lot. So let's grab this patch. And now we're going to connect this thread to not. Space this out a little more. And we'll connect this thread to our particle. And now let's take a look at what happens. We can touch the screen right now. Our mask is on and our positive particles are on. And when I touch the screen, look at that. The negative particles go on and our mask and positive particles disappear. Amazing. So cool, right? So like I said, like this might not be like text coming down the screen like the matrix, but this is, this is a form of coding. This is actually like a training ground for coding. So we've done some coding here today. And so let's just take like one more second to think about what's happening inside of each one of these blocks. So inside of here is a series of lines of code that detect when the screen is tapped. That's connected to a block that controls a switch, which we also learned is another word for a Boolean, something that only has two outcomes. It can either be true or false, off or on. And we want to be able to use the tab to switch off and on. So we wouldn't select this arrow because it only turns things on. We wouldn't select this arrow because it only turns things off, but we can select this arrow because it's connected to the flip, which can you know, flip the switch off and on. Then we have our patches that are all associated to an element inside of our actual design. So our switch connects to this face mesh and the positive particles so that they are both working at the same time. Whenever we tap the screen, they'll both react in tandem the same way and they'll turn off and on. If I tap the screen and the mask and the particles are on, they'll turn them off. If I tap the screen and the mask and the particles are off, this will turn them on. 
And then we've got this really handy block called not. And not is um, basically read like a switch. Um, we're not going to turn on the emitter when these two things are on, and then we are when they're off. So it flips our switch so that our switch is saying, okay, turn it on. And then um, that knot is going to be like, we're not turning it on. And then the switch will say, turn it off. And the knot is going to say, we're not turning it off. So we've got um, this great touch interaction now. Uh, I'll add a screen recording of what it looks like on the phone. And that's it. This is it for our for our filter today. All right, so we did it. We made our second filter in this collab module. And uh, I think it looks pretty great. I hope you made something that is tied to your drawing or your doodle inside of your notebook, something that's like really inspiring to you and the kinds of things you'd like to be protected from. May they be physical or emotional or abstract are fantastical. Um, so yeah, I think that now we'll just continue the exercise that we did yesterday. So on that same page, maybe draw a line beneath our list yesterday. I want us to continue our list of things that our computer knows about us. So now what does our computer know about us? How do we know what it knows? What data is being collected? What kinds of information have these filter features provided our computer and how do we when when we create new features um, we need to think about how fluid those decisions are and how much information the computer is able to collect on our behalf and so hopefully by the end of this session we'll be able to see like a whole list of things that our computer knows about us and think about how that exists out in the world as well. Like what kinds of information does do computers out in the world know about us as we move through their spaces? Um, yeah, so uh, in terms of the filter, I'm gonna leave a um, screen recording of what mine ends up looking like. Uh, and you can test yours again on the Spark AR app if you want to, you don't have to. and next video is all about mass as cultural expression, which is really cool. So thinking about what your history, your ancestry, your, your like racial history, your geographic history, um, what kinds of ways have your people use mass to express their culture and their heritage and the things that are valuable to them. Um, so that's the next one. And yeah, I'll see you over there.